let's uh let's have fun all right so we started this last time we're doing shortest paths but we're allowing for negative edge lengths and later we'll also do all pair shortest paths and this has been you know we've been doing graphs for a little while and we went through this example last time uh you know what's the distance from s to t but now i'm allowing for negative edges right uh Hmm. Um, right, so, so the green path is, is better because it turns out there's this big fat negative 10 along that path. And and we had just started to get into this uh, discussion of, of how to make an algorithm for this kind of problem. Uh, one suggestion that we discussed was, oh, why don't I add a, a big enough number to every edge to make all the edges positive? Uh, but the conclusion of our discussion is, well, that's not fair to, to the paths that have more edges and stuff like this, right? So that's actually gonna change the relative ordering of what's the best path and things like this. So that. That won't quite work, although it is a good idea in the sense that, okay, it's always good to try to reuse old algorithms. That's not a bad idea. It just happens that here, it doesn't work. So, okay, we also discussed why Dijkstra would be flawed. Dijkstra would label B and D before it realized that you're supposed to go through C to D. So, so our intuition from before, isn't working. We also talked about negative cycles. That's something that can happen now. Right. So those three high level questions. How to deal with negative cycles? What's the difference between the shortest walk and the shortest path? And then when I'm gonna to come to an algorithm, what's the right induction hypothesis? Whatever we did for Dijkstra does not seem to at least directly extend. Okay. So so here's, here is a lemma that's making a distinction that didn't come up before. Okay, so suppose I have two vertices S and T, and in an interesting case, there's some way to get from S to T. Okay, so whatever the distance is, which is the infimum of all possible lengths, it's not positive infinity. It's finite or negative infinity. Okay, with positive edge lengths, we never had this negative infinity issue, and we're just done, right? Also with positive edge lengths, there's no point in having a cycle, right? So if this is S and this, this is T, and I'm walking around and I loop around, you know, this thing is at least not, is at least zero, that loop, right? It's not really helping us. Okay, so somehow we just never really had to worry about this distinction with positive edge weights, but now, now it's more subtle. Right? So there's two things this lemma is trying to clarify. When are things finite and when are things negative infinity? And when is the distance attained by a path and when is it attained by a walk? Okay, so we can sharpen that. So let S and T be two vertices. And suppose S can get, get to T. The distance from S to T is finite, so not negative infinity, if and only if the shortest ST walk is attained by a path. So, so that means if it's negative in infinity, then yeah, there's no, okay. So that's, so, so we have this nice kind of thing is that the, the paths that we're sort of comfortable with, okay, also correspond to the finite case, which we're also maybe more comfortable with. And the degeneracy, the negative infinity is really when you can't get a path that gets the value. So, okay, maybe, this feels subtle, but it will be very nice to have this very kind of clear dichotomy in the ensuing discussion. So, okay. So, so for let's look at the if part of the statement. Uh, so, if suppose the shortest st walk is attained by a path, right? So, uh, 
you have some DST that's equal, to, you know, the distance is equal to Uh, yeah, okay, so I think this is actually not so strong of a statement, but, uh, 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 okay, I see. Let me change this W to a P. Okay, so if the true distance, whatever the implement is, is equal to the length of some path, Okay, then it has to be finite because it's just adding up a finite number of edges. So this is, this part is not actually so interesting. It's just walking through uh, the definitions. Okay, let's do the only if. Okay. So, okay, so suppose the distance is finite. It's some value that I denoted capital L. So this is the more interesting case. I want to argue that there's some path was total length equal to dst. Okay, so so here I want to argue there's a path, like because the definition is just the infimum over all walks, and the path is this particularly nice walk. So it's quite possible that it's only attained by walks that aren't paths. Okay. So I oh maybe I should be a little bit careful here. I'm not sure if I made this distinction. So a walk is just any way to get from point A to point B, allowing repeats. And a path specifically means no vertices repeat. Okay, so I'm not sure if I ever said that explicitly. Um, but uh, so those are the rules. Okay. Uh, okay, so. All right, suppose, suppose this is the case. Then there's some walk. Okay. Um, if the infimum is finite, then actually there must be some walk that reaches that value. Okay. So, all right, so let W be an ST walk with length L. And here's maybe one subtle part. I'm gonna choose the walk with the minimum number of edges in it. So there may be many walks, ways to get from point A to point B, and they may be repeating and all these kinds of things. But I'm gonna use as a tiebreaker, the one with the minimum number of edges. And I'm gonna to try to argue this must be a path. So, okay, so suppose by contradiction, W contains a cycle, right? If it didn't, then we'd be done because it would be a path like we wanted. Okay, so, okay. I want to try to, ar yeah. I want to try to argue that this can't happen, right? If this can't happen, then it's a path and we're happy. So why can't this happen? Or how can I break down an argument to argue that this can't happen? Okay, so we can have two cases, which are down here. Okay, so in one case, the length is uh, non-negative, it's greater than zero. The other case, it's less than zero. And now we just have to, yeah, deal with these. So why can't, or you can pick either case you want. Oh, cool. Hmm? No, so I'm, I want to argue W doesn't have any cycle. Uh, so the claim is that if the distance is finite, then it's attained by a walk that doesn't repeat, also known as a path, strictly speaking. And it, I, that might feel a little subtle, but we'll use it algorithmically in a moment. So, okay, any of you can pick one of these two cases and show why there's a contradiction. And once we address both, we're done. So pick a case, tell me what the contradiction is for that case. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, even, this is the same, same net effect. But if this, if this had negative length, this was like negative two, then I can repeat even just once. And then I would get a walk of length L minus two or something smaller than L. And that's a contradiction because L was supposed to be the lower bound. 
push that further, you can even go to negative infinity. But so this suffices for the contradiction. Okay, one case remains. How come I can't have a non-negative cycle? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if I if I took this cycle and removed it, and I only looked at this like uh, uh, remaining path from S to T, like that, then uh, this path is going to be no longer than the one where I omitted a cycle, which is just subtracting some non-negative value. Okay, so nothing too complicated, um, but at least uh, you know it gives us a little more handle on when negative infinity occurs because this is sort of we're not going to be able to get a good algorithm without really understanding how to deal with the negative infinite case so we're just characterizing what's going on okay so so we've addressed this this question sort of what's going on between walks and paths and okay maybe we can get into well, this is really asking, how can I make an algorithm? Because the induction hypothesis is very closely related to why Dijkstra's algorithm works, breath-first search works. So, so really what I'm asking now is, how, how can we make an algorithm? Any ideas? Any, any ideas for trying to get a principled algorithm going? Doesn't have to be great ideas or correct ideas, maybe just fun ideas to get the discussion going is is fine too. It's fun to think about these questions before I reveal the answer, so An algorithm for finding the shortest, the distance from S to T when there might be negative edges. We know that Dijkstra's algorithm won't work. Yeah. They could exist. Yeah. I would be happy with any answer for either situation, though. It's more fun to try to make algorithms yourself than to be told an algorithm, so this is your opportunity. Okay so okay so let's walk through that idea a little bit more explicitly. So where would I start like what would the first step be? Like let's just expand out that idea. So I would be careful in the sense that if I understand your suggestion correctly, uh, looking at this graph here, you would find, you know, your your length distance to d would go down. That doesn't necessarily indicate a negative cycle. It just means you're, yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, okay, so if I made a recursive algorithm, uh, 
uh, I'll call it dist or something. Uh, shortest path from S to T. And if I try to implement this, okay, what might I do? So the, in the base case, S is equal to T or something. Maybe you return zero, although even though the distance might be negative infinity, but setting that aside. So let's say you're sort of going, trying to go from S to T. What might a first step sort of look like? Okay, and then, and then just return like the best one. So the general case, the interesting part, might look like return to minimum. Oh, what did I do? Okay, I'll just zoom in. So return uh, the minimum, uh, I guess, of all edges of the form L going from like S to R. Plus now the distance from R to T. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. Uh, over all, all of those edges, all those arcs SR that are leaving S. Okay, so, okay, it's, maybe I can drag this over. Uh, so, in, in the general case, if I'm at a vertex S, let me try all the outgoing edges and then find the best path from, from R to T or something. Right, and add it. Okay. And, and if, if recursively it does R correctly, then they should also give this or something, right? Okay. All right, so this is, this is um, instructive. So there's a slight, um, so this won't work, but the question is why? Because this seems to be exactly what I've taught us to do up to this point. So what, what yeah. Okay, but where does that, where does that show in? Because it looks like, oh, I have some sentence, and if I'm doing the sentence correctly from R, what if I actually, what if I told you it won't work even if there were, uh, okay, okay, but, but why, why, well, but I, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so let me, let me ask this question. So let's say I even want to just compute this which is different than distance. I actually want to compute the length of the shortest path from S to T. That's some finite value. Will this code actually give me this? Yeah. Sure, and wh what motivates this? Why? Why do you want to do this? So I, in this I want to path from S to T. And I'm saying, okay, go from S to R and now find the best path from R to T. But what if the best path from R to T goes through S? Right? So actually our sentence is not strong enough Right, you don't actually want the shortest path from R to T. You want the shortest path from R to T that doesn't go through S if your goal is to get a path starting from S, right? So it's not actually strong enough in this sentence. So that's actually where it breaks within that logic. One reason why you might want to go back to S is because there exist negative edges. So, and then quite simply, this algorithm may recurse and recurse and recurse. So you need to have some kind of, you know, ordering and and stuff for, for induction to actually work. So that, that's actually kind of what we're, we're lacking, but it's a good idea. And it's good to see why it's, it falls short because this is a natural way of thinking. Now, if you, we could like extend this and I can add like a set of big set of vertices. Like you or something and say, oh, give me the length of the shortest path from S to T that's only using vertices inside U. So initially I'll start with U equal to V and I can remove vertices from this set, right, as, as I use them. And that will make sure I don't reuse vertices. 
And that would actually be a correct algorithm, at least if you're trying to get the length of the shortest path and not necessarily distance or slight distinction. But it might not be very fast. You know, you can apply dynamic programming, but it still won't be fast. What's the issue? Why can't I apply dynamic programming to this? It is, induction is correct. The sets you are getting smaller, right? So you actually are getting smaller problems, but yeah. No, I'm not actually too worried about this loop. Yeah, that's a factor of n, but actually this is going to be exponential time, but the question is why? Yeah. Well, in a sense, induction is okay, because if I update this and made u smaller, I subtracted s, you will be getting smaller. The depth of your recursion will always be n levels down, and there'll be no vertices left to use, right? But how come I can't just throw dynamic programming at this and say it's polynomial time? Yeah. You could fill it up. I could run this. Well, the problem is the tables in your in your language is so big. So we have so many subproblems because you can be any subset of vertices, right? So you have two to the n possibilities. So it turns yeah, that's that's the particular issue. Okay, but I think it's still worth fleshing out. So here's the approach we're going to take, which might seem clumsy, but it works. So here is maybe a different problem. Okay. Suppose I, I, I now added a parameter k, like 10. And I say, what's the length of the shortest walk from s to t using at most 10 edges? We'll focus on this. Slightly different problem, right? But I'm parameterizing by number of edges you're allowed to use while trying to get the minimum length, okay? Uh, how might you go about this problem? Okay, so we pass k instead of u. So I think I would phrase that as, oh, can we do induction on k? Because k equals 0 is very easy. k equal 1 is probably pretty easy. And if I figured out k equals 1, then maybe I can figure out k equals 2. Okay, so, so to do an algorithm like this, what's the first, first step? All right, we're going to write some kind of sentence, right? So I guess I filled in our parameters for us. Shortest walk from a vertex, v comma i, and what might the sentence be? Maybe I just said it, but I'm still making you say it. i could be one of these values between 1 and k. Yeah, okay, so this will be the length of the shortest walk from S to V with at most I edges. And this might feel clumsy, we're introducing a parameter, but I think it will at least be easier to see why the algorithm is at least doing what it says, right? This problem seems like ah, I don't have to deal with, you know, negative cycles that go on forever and stuff because I'm only worried about 10 steps, 11 steps, 12 steps, right? So we're, we're breaking it down a little bit. And Okay, so let's let's implement this. So for whatever reason, v is supposed to be the endpoint as it's set up. I could have also set it up so that v is a starting point, but today v is the endpoint. So your goal is to go from s to v with at most i steps in a particular subproblem. Okay. So okay, what can we do? How do I implement this? What should I write first? Okay, so i equals zero seems like a natural base case. Sorry. Right. 
Okay, so if v is equal to s, then what? Then return zero. If v is not s, then positive infinity. We can use that to denote there's no there's no walk. Okay. All right. So now let's look at i greater than zero. Is at least one or something. Yeah, so we'll, we'll need to use I minus one. So I think you're saying, okay, I'm trying to get from S to V, and we need to try to guess the edge that comes before. Okay, so let me know if this is what you had in mind. Uh, the minimum uh, over all edges of the form UV. Okay, so U is the incoming neighbor. And so, so what should I write here? What expression should I write? S, W, U I minus one length of U V. Okay, so I go to U and I minus one steps and I take one more edge. And I return that. All right, are we happy with this? I'm almost happy. We're missing something. Well, I defined I right here, right? Length of shortest walk with that most I edges. Yeah? Yeah, it doesn't, it does, it's true. It doesn't explicitly count for negative cycles. That's actually not precisely what I was worried about. So, okay, so let's say i is 10, right? Now I'm trying to go from, go to u in nine steps and add a 10th edge, right? So that will give me 10 edge walks. But what's, what's the sentence asking for? It's not that actually part that I'm concerned with. The shortest walk with at most, say, 10 edges. So it's saying that you don't have to use 10 edges. Yeah, so we can also add this. So this is certainly part of it, but there's another option where I don't take advantage of the 10th edge. So at a minimum, we can write SW VI minus one, right? So. I could take a step, or maybe you're better off using nine edges or something, right? If it's like a bipartite graph where you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you can only get there in like 10 edges, an even number of edges or something, right? So, yeah. I think this is true of any vertex. You're trying to go from S to V, right? And it could be the best one uses 10 edges, but it could be the best one uses nine edges. I don't think I'm understanding at all. Uh, Well, remember, if V is equal to S, you may actually want to follow loops, right? Cycles to go down and down. Yeah. 
Besides, at most, you're just going to say recursive calls for S and not the other vertices. So it's not going to make a big difference in the overall running time. Yeah. I, the problem is just to find the shortest walk with at most K right now. The, the problem has changed a little. So that's given to you externally. Okay, so, so that, that's an algorithm. It's, it's relatively simple though, right? It's pretty conservative. Okay, you try nine edges, you try 10 edges. Clearly it's gonna implement this sentence correctly. Okay. All right, so, but maybe what's in, one thing interesting is what's the running time of this algorithm? So to calculate the running time, uh, I'm just summing over basically all the subproblems, right? So from one to K, and then summing over all the vertices. Question. Yeah, because if I'm worried, if I'm at ten, and I'm worried about nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Less, luckily, the nine problem will get me anything less than equal to nine. So nine problem includes eight, seven, six, five, four. That's all in the sentence. Well, we're implementing the 10 problem, right? But I'm assuming by induction, a nine problem accounts for eight, seven, six, five, four. Yeah. But you're, you're, it, so if we didn't do this, right? Uh, uh, so so take so here's here's for example take v is equal to s and suppose there's no negative cycles. So the answer is just to take no edges and stay there. Okay, and your algorithm is going to be looking at s w. S1, and it's only going to be looking at like incoming edges to S, and they're all going to have positive value, and you're going to conclude, oh, there's no way to get to S unless than equal to one edge. That's probably not what you want. So if this was not there, and I'm looking at I is equal to one, and this was S, okay? And this is going to go look at all the edges going into S, U comma S. And from our base case, all the u's are going to have positive infinity because that's the zero. So for s is equal to v, you're going to be looking at some positive infinity plus some length. And you're going to conclude, oh, uh, the length of the shortest walk from s to s with at most one edge is positive infinity because you didn't include this. OK, so let's look at this running time. So I'm doing the same thing where I'm summing up the, the time I spend on all the subproblems. So there's k choices of i, and then for each choice, I'm summing over all the vertices. So what's the running time for one of these things? How much do I spend solving one subproblem, excluding the, the time spent on the recursive subproblems? Okay, so M because I'm looping over all the edges. Okay. Anyone have a better upper bound? So the loop is the bottleneck. Question is how big is the loop? Yeah, so M is all the edges. And at the very least, N, right? There's only N incoming neighbors. Okay, so that would be better than M. And you can even be a little bit more careful and say, oh, it's really the number of in neighbors for V, which is sometimes called the in degree of v. So let's see, did I write this out? Yeah. So I can sum up, you know, maybe some constant because there's also an if statement and stuff, plus really the, the size of the loop is the in degree of v. So why is this useful? What happens when I sum up the in degree of v over all the vertices? Two times the edges? You could do better than that. One times the number of edges. Because it's, it's only something in degree, not total degree. So each edge only gets counted once. Of course, I don't really care about the one or the two. 
So you get O K M plus M. Okay, so you lose a factor of K compared to Dijkstra's uh, modular logs. Okay, so I, I should mention that this is the one time where you previously when we this is really a dynamic programming algorithm. And before all the problems had the exact same size or amount of time it took. So we just did this times the number of problems. Here you, we were a little bit more careful because we observed, oh, different problems have different amount of time it takes, and they sum up more carefully to something nice. Okay, so for graph problems, that happens sometimes. Okay. So that that's that. Okay, so so now we have this this tool, right? Where for any particular number of edges, I can at least get the length of the shortest walk. And now I want to use this tool to now ultimately solve my what's the distance from s to t problem. Okay, but what this tool does is very precise. Like we know exactly what it does. We've established this. We feel good about this. Now we want to we want to use it. Okay. All right. So. Um, so okay, I put the code on the right. So we have two cases, or maybe what I've done is uh, I'm going to first ask in a slightly easier situation. What if I promise there's no negative cycles? No negative cycles. All the distances are finite. And then we'll figure out what to do here, and then introduce negative cycles after. So, so how can I? How can we use what we've developed? For the special case where there's no negative cycles. Okay, um, we can try doing SW uh, VM for all the vertices V. Okay, why did you choose M? So, so how come, how, but how do I know I don't want to cycle? Yeah, I just want to make explicit this lemma that we used before. If there's no negative cycles, then we showed it suffices to look at paths, right? There's no negative cycles, it suffices to look at paths. And okay, so that's that's a key point. So now you chose M because there's that most M edges in the path. Can anyone do slightly better than M? Yeah. Uh, it can be N because vertices won't repeat. Can anyone do slightly better than N? Not that it matters too much. Yeah. And N minus one would actually suffice. Okay. So so with this. If I was promised that there's no negative infinite distances or no negative cycles, and I only have to worry about paths, then doing this n minus one deep would suffice. Okay, so we're getting closer towards the complete algorithm. Yeah. Sorry, you want to find the diameter? You want to find the maximum distance between any two points? And what, how would that help you? Oh, you mean like the number of edge, edgewise diameter? Um, yeah, but in the worst case, it could be like n, right? So you're not going to get much win there in the worst case. OK. Um, oh, actually, that's also deceptive. That also won't work because uh, so you can have something like this, right? So the even with no negative distances, but with negative edges, right? Maybe the 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 shortest length path from S to T uses many edges, okay? But there's some way to get there in two two edges. It's just that the edge weights are very big. And maybe that's true of all the vertices, right? That 
all the vertices, there's a short number of, there's always two hops or something to get from S to V, but in general, you want to use many edges. So that graph will have diameter very small, like one or two. And if you put one or two here, you won't find the long path. Yeah. Okay. Interesting idea though. So, all right. So the real question now is how do I deal with negative infinity? Any ideas? Oh, uh, any ideas? Uh, fun ideas. It doesn't have to be the right idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me I'll, I'll ask you. So, mm, so what should I do algorithmically? Say if I've already run S W V to n minus one for all v. So I, I I did the first part right. And if if there was no negative cycles, those are the values we want. But I don't know if there's negative cycles. An upper bound? Uh, well, it's possible that uh, there's no negative cycles with only n minus one edges, right? So it's possible that we won't even necessarily traverse an entire negative cycle. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if I ran it one more time, yeah, and certainly like, if I if I did run it one more time and I noticed one of the values went down, then it'd be like, oh, that's weird. That shouldn't happen if there was no negative cycles, right? We should have finished at n minus one. So that's that's. So let's let's explore this direction. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of the set of vertices that go down each round. So a sub 10, those are the vertices we're really using 10 edges instead of 9 seem to help, right? So in particular, what about a sub n? a sub n will be the vertices that for some reason it helped to use n edges instead of n minus 1. So what does that say about a vertex in A sub n? Right, you're just building this algorithm. You're watching those values come in. You ran n minus 1. You ran it n times, and this vertex value went down. What does that say about the vertex? Yeah, if if it was finite, it shouldn't have gone down. If the true distance to that vertex was finite, it shouldn't have gone down. It can only go down if the the shortest walk was not a path, right? Because you found something shorter, it's using n edges. There's no way that's a path anymore. So that vertex you already know has negative infinite distance. Okay. So okay, so every vertex that improved on the nth round must have negative infinite distance. You know that right away, right? And in general, any vertex, if I kept going, a n plus one, a n plus two, a n plus three, if the vertex distance 
the, the, the value went down, okay, it must be negative infinity because you're finding something that's not a path that's better than the best path. Okay, so, okay, so, uh, okay, so, all right, so all of these, anything in A sub K for K bigger than N, you know, the vertices that are improving must have negative dis distance. Okay, so, all right, so, so really, Anyone that has negative infinity distance will at some point improve past n. So I could take our algorithm and just run it forever. Like, uh, and whenever our vertex goes down, I'll, I'll label it. But of course that algorithm doesn't terminate, right? So, so the real question is how do I identify all these sets? But I don't really want to run a to the 1000 n or something, right? I don't want to run this thing forever to identify all the vertices that will eventually ever go down. But those are the vertices I'm trying to identify. So how can I implicitly get all of these bigger A sub i's? That's the question. Okay, Those will be exactly the vertices with negative infinite distance. So once I identify those, those guys get negative infinity, the other values we've already calculated, and then we're done. OK. All right. so. Uh, to tease this out, we got to be a little bit careful. So here's the first claim. So here's the vertices that improved in round 100. And the claim is that the vertices that improved in round 101 have to be an out neighbor, like it has to go from a vertex that improved in round 100. Okay. So as a picture, it looks more like this. So why? Yeah, so 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 you know V SWV K plus one or something is using 101 edges, right? And and first the algorithm is telling you, well, if you use 101 at most 101 edges, you can do better than using at most 100. And the only difference is that you can now use 101 edges. So you know it's going to use 101 edges, okay? And uh, and it needs to come from something that I'm so it's coming from something that was 100 edges, and it got its best score. Um, because if it didn't get its best score, like if this vertex got the score was 99 edges, then it would have improved at 100. Okay, I feel like this is not the clearest explanation, but, but it will suffice. Okay. Has to be what? Because it comes back to this lemma. So if it's finite, then the shortest walk should have been attained by a path. So as soon as, as, soon as I'm able to improve with n plus 1, n plus 2 edges, that means I found a walk that's using more edges than can be in a path. We don't, it's just that if we see an improvement at n plus one, then I know that it's negative infinity. I'm trying to gather anyone who improved for any value bigger than n, because those are the negative infinity. So, okay, so was that established? I'll go a little quicker now. All right, so, okay, so that means that a sub n plus one is, you know, leaves a sub n, and a sub n plus two leaves a sub n kind of twice, right? It's going from a sub n and it's some subset of taking two hops. Oops. Something like this, okay? And, okay. And, uh, okay, so if T is reachable, 
Uh, if t is in some a sub k for k bigger than n, so if t has negative infinity, then it should be reachable from a sub n, right? Because this is saying, okay, a sub n plus 2 is all within 2 hops of a sub n. a sub n plus 3 is within 3 hops of a sub n. Okay. So, okay, so that's good. On the flip side, if I can reach, go to a sub n, and a sub n can get to t, right? We already deemed that everyone in a sub n has negative infinite distance. Right? Because it improved on the nth one. That shouldn't be the case if the path was the best. So I can go to a vertex in a sub n an arbitrarily small distance and then go to t. In that way, t is also arbitrarily small. Okay? So my goal is to, is to really identify all of the a sub k's for k bigger than n. I know that they're all reachable from a sub n, and simultaneously, if a sub n can reach it, then it's also negative infinity. So in fact, in the final algorithm, you just need to identify the vertices that are reachable from a sub n. These are the vertices that improved when they weren't supposed to improve. So ultimately, in your algorithm, all you have to do is instead of doing the n minus 1 rounds, do n rounds. Everyone who improved, they're already negative infinity. And now just run breadth first search, depth first search from these vertices and see who they can reach. And they're also negative infinity. And that's all the negative infinities. That's what we sort of teased out carefully. Okay, so that's, that's how you deal with negative cycles and things like that. And next time we'll do all pair shortest path. Okay. So our goal today is to do this version of a shortest path problem. So uh, before now, we have focused on uh, one vertex S going to everyone else. Now we're going to look at everyone going to everyone. See if you could do something in the aggregate a little better than you could on its own. So I wanted to maybe remind us just a little bit about what we did last time. So we're looking at negative edges, which uh, kind of threw a wrench into what we had previously developed with Dijkstra's algorithm and breadth first search. And you know, the main thing I think we did was we came up with a recursive algorithm where we introduced this parameter i, the number of edges, Right? It's only if I'm just worried about using 10 edges, 9 edges, 11 edges, stuff like this, then part of the you know, confusion about, oh, negative cycles, you can go forever, that's sort of put on hold, right? Because you can only use so many edges, you can't just cycle forever. And so we can at least kind of solve this problem, which seems clumsier than what we need. But, but then uh, afterwards, we then did a little bit of analysis. And uh, and show that, oh, OK, if I kind of pay attention to which vertices improved on the nth edge, which shouldn't help unless you're using a negative cycle or something, then I can identify uh, with a little bit more thought how to get all the vertices that are at distance negative infinity. Okay. But the algorithm itself was fairly, I think, maybe conceptually simpler than, say, Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, where we just parameterize by number of edges. I would argue that Dijkstra's algorithm is more careful and subtle and aggressive compared to this one, at least for doing this task. So OK, with that, let's move on now to all pairs shortest paths. So the goal is to compute. Uh, the distance between any two points for all s and t. And uh, despite what we did last time, I'm going to assume there's no negative cycles in the graph. So easier to present this way. And we can use our algorithm from before to detect that there's negative cycles. But anyhow. OK, so that is uh, the task. The obvious thing we can do, of course, is we can run our algorithm from last time, which took mn time, from every vertex, that's mn squared. So that's our baseline. 
They want to see if we can do something in the aggregate a little bit better than running from every possible choice of S. All right, so looks like the same slide. Uh, rats. OK. Well, I wanted to give you all a chance to try to think of or suggest any possible algorithms for this problem. OK, I'll give a more suggestive or directional thing. Let's try to think of a recursive algorithm for this problem. And at some level, try to define some kind of sentence that will let us break it down. Anyone want to suggest something to get us going? Okay, so if I wanted to do an algorithm like that, um, you know, uh, okay, I think you're describing an algorithm. So let's try to figure out, you know, what's the input, what's the output, right? Let's try to write sentence down so we're all on the same page. So, yeah, what do you have in mind for the input and the output? Oh, okay, so you... Uh, so it's some function, uh, uh, I guess I'll call it short. So you said the input is a vertex. OK, so uh, OK, so sorry, you want a second input. OK, and what does this return? Uh, returns the distance from S to T. OK, maybe I'll rename this dist. OK, so that's sort of describes what we're looking for. And I want to do this for all, all choices S and T, right? So if I wanted to implement this, OK, so why should I do this? Sorry? Yeah, so S and T are, are here supposed to be generic. These could be any two vertices in the graph. So ultimately, we can compute for all pairs, or we'll want to compute for all pairs, this S, T. Yeah, but let's, let's try to implement this. So the first line, what should I do? Okay. Return 0. OK, now if S is not equal to T, Sorry. Uh, OK, so I can look at like uh, the minimum overall. So you're saying I should look at edges that are leaving S. So I'll, I'll look over all edges like of the form SV. OK. So from V to T. Then vertex v eventually you can get the t. Plus 
plus length SV. Okay, so here's sort of our sentence. It says, uh, this ST is supposed to be the distance from S to T. And if S is not equal to, if S is equal to T, you're done. There's no negative cycle, so you can't do better than zero. Oh, wait, is that even true? Oh, no, you could still, oh, no, you can't do better than zero. Sorry, I'm being silly. And uh, if S is not T, let me try to take the first step from S. Okay, so this seems like it kind of, the idea seems to match, right? Uh, it seems like, well, as defined, oh, this should be dist, not D. That's going to return the distance, and I'm going to take some good step, right? Okay. Um, does anyone have any comments about this? Yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah, so this, let's, let's go to the point of induction, right? So it's saying, okay, to solve the problem from S to T, let's reduce it to a bunch of problems from other vertices from V to T. So you're probably hoping that, I don't know, you've saved or solved this problem before, right? But uh, of course, you know, if there's just like a cycle, And you can do one recursive call to one recursive call to one recursive call, right? Around and around and around and around. This is sort of an issue that came up last time too, right? So uh, I don't agree. I mean, I agree that this is sort of like uh, mathematically correct in some sense. If this is really the distance, then it should obey this equation. But we don't necessarily have an algorithm uh, because there's no ordering to our subproblems, and this will just get you in an infinite loop. Okay? But this is a very natural thing to do. And the real conceptual question is, how can I make this into an algorithm, an efficient algorithm? So you want to do marking? OK, we can do marking like Dijkstra's. You could still have negative edges, though. So this will go all the way back to an example from Friday or even Wednesday, which is this one here. If you did some kind of marking algorithm, right, you have to be careful. You know, If you did a recursive call to here and a recursive call to here, right, and you mark them and you solve them, you're trying to go from A to D, then later when you go to C, you know, you're not going to get what you're, you're looking for. So, so the marking algorithm start to look like Dijkstra's algorithm. We know that Dijkstra's algorithm has a little bit of trouble with negative edges because there's no obvious ordering in which you should. So the, when you have positive edge weights, you know you can safely assign the closest, second closest, third closest in order. And so there's this implicit ordering where you can gradually build up a solution. But that the ordering breaks is negative edges. So we're just trying to figure out how to break this problem down. So marking is not quite the answer. Anything else? Huh? Two? What should we change it to? D of N? Oh, okay. I hadn't thought of that before. Uh, returns all pairs of shortest pass. Uh, Oh, I guess maybe it'll take as input a graph G. 
uh, in G, but we can do induction on the number of vertices in G or something like this. Okay. So how would you do it? So if it's an empty graph or something, maybe you just return nothing. So in a, in a general case, how would you nibble away? So in the general case, you have a you have a graph, and you're actually taking a you're going to probably take away a node. So you pick a node, and then and then what? Okay, so I'll take out a node, get all pair shortest path in the remaining graph, and then put the node back in. So what processing should we do? If it's isolated, of course, that's not problematic. So, so an interesting case that's nodes in the middle, and you get all these distances that don't use the node, right? Well, the the sub problem you're going to take the node out, so you're going to get back all these sub problem. I mean, distances that doesn't use the node you removed. Okay, so you have your graph G, right? What, what happened? Sorry. So you have your graph G, and you're saying, I'm going to pick out one node arbitrarily, and let me, let me like, rip it out. Uh, maybe I'll take it from the edge. So I'll rip it out, and now I'm looking at the rest of the graph. It kind of looks like this, I guess, right? And in the subproblem, I'll look at the graph that it removes that vertex, and I'll get the best distances I can. So you'll get all these distances between nodes, and those paths are not using the vertex you removed. Okay, so now you want to get it for the original graph. So your subproblem will give you like distances over those n minus one vertices. So you know between. Uh, between this vertex and this vertex, I have some path that doesn't use the yellow vertex. And my worry is, how? How? So I think it might be possible. So first we have to figure out the distance from everybody to yellow and yellow to everybody. So maybe, okay, if I'm going to yellow from everybody, I know it needs to take one step to some other vertex, and then it's going to go along some path. So maybe we can use, uh, we can look at that, like, oh, what happens if I hop from the vertex I removed and then found the best path using everything else from my subproblem, and vice versa, yeah? No, well, so so we don't have a, we're not ordering, well, so that yellow vertex was kind of picked out arbitrarily, but we can do induction on the number of vertices in the subproblem. Yeah, so I think actually, okay, this this idea is going to reappear actually by the end of this lecture. So let me just flesh out while we've had this discussion going. But I can maybe try, first I have to figure out the distances to and from the vertex we removed. So that's like one edge incident to the vertex we removed, and the rest should take the best path through the rest of the graph. So maybe that's doable. And then afterwards, now I'm worried about red to red, because maybe that should go through yellow. Right? But you could say, okay, if I feel very good about the ways to go to and from yellow, for every pair, I can check to see what's the length of the shortest path to yellow, and then from yellow to the other endpoint or something. So I think this will be okay, and I think it'll take maybe n cubed time. Okay, I think this will be implicitly similar to something we'll do by the end of the lecture, and also implicitly similar to your suggestion.
Maybe you guys have seen this. So <laughs> unfortunately, the, the slides are going in a slightly different direction. So let me let me do a different approach first. So let's try something uh, just like we did last time before we did s comma i. The, the distance is uh, from s. Or no, I think before we had fixed s, then maybe we only had t. No, no, no. Last time we fixed t, the destination, we only varied s. And say, okay, what's the best way to get from S to T, which is external and at most I steps? Well, now I want to do many T's. So let me just add that as a parameter. This is also a relatively natural idea, I think. And then I still have the induction on I, right? 9, 10, 11 kind of thing. So that's not bad. So we'll get to that other algorithm later, but let's try to implement this one first. Okay, so how, how would we implement this? All right, what are the easy base cases? Okay. Not working so well. Okay, so I can do like zero or, or positive infinity or something, right? And then what would the general case look like? Okay, so one option is to not use a new edge, just like last time. And another option is to try to take a step from S. Uh, okay, uh, I'll write it this way, SW, I guess uh, this will go from S to U, U T I minus one plus length S U. And I'll write like uh, for all, edges SU that are leaving S. And then, uh, okay, I'm going to be lazy. You could also maybe do something from the T side, but at some level, those paths will still kind of be captured by this just from going the other direction. So I think this will still cover our cases. Yeah, although maybe it doesn't hurt to be safe and write the other one. You also suggested taking a step from S and a step from T which is slightly redundant, but if you do that, make sure you do i minus two, in which case we should probably write something for i equal negative one, that could happen, right? If you're at one and you subtract two, so you should be, okay, so, but this will work, just this. So, okay, so that's, uh, that's simple enough. Uh, this is completely analogous to what we did last time. I guess here I'm taking a step backwards from t, but same idea. Okay, so what's the running time? If we if we use dynamic programming. Uh, o of M, M, M plus N. OK, so let's first count how many different sub problems do I have? So we only have to do it up to N edges because we know there's no negative edge or even if there was. Yeah, right. We only have to go up to N. So how many sub problems do we have? Sorry, uh, n cubed. So I guess we have n choices of i, n choices of t, n choices of s. Okay, and right, right. But of course, there's this loop. Right, I'm looping over arcs. So okay, there are n cubes. So let me write this out. There's n of these choices, n of these choices, n of these choices. Uh, sorry. Uh, N. 
no, the n choices are of i. You're going to i from 1 to n. Yeah, but ultimately you're going to want to use up to n. So the biggest i needs to be is n. i otherwise here is meant to just be a parameter. So there's nq subproblems, but we should probably be focusing on how many total edges we're looking at here, right? So this loop, uh, I guess it's in degree of t. It's how many arcs go into t, okay? So if I look at one particular value of i and one particular arc ut, how many times do I look at that arc? It's really the sum of how many times I look at these arcs. So one particular arc from u to t for one particular i, how many times does this algorithm look at it? No? Yeah, so let's look at a particular choice of arc, u comma t, right? u goes to t. And let's look at a particular value of i, like i is equal to 5. If I can figure out how many times this one arc is looked at, over all choices of s and t, but for fixed i, then I can just multiply by n, because that's how many choices of i. I should have phrased it that way. OK, why, why i times? Oh, so here I fixed i. i is some fixed value. For fixed value, but the ver I'm varying over s and t. How many times do I look at an arc? Sorry? M? OK, why m? Sorry? No. I'm only. Well, okay, so in a star graph, m halves. Yeah. Okay, I think I did a terrible job of framing this question. So, uh, what I meant to say is okay, so I want to sum up over. Okay. Okay, so the real running time is something like the sum over all choices of s, t, and i, the time to spend on that subproblem defined by s, t, and i. Okay, and this subproblem is going to take time really proportional to the n degree of t. Okay. Sorry, I'm didn't allocate space very well. And if I sum over the n degree of t over all t, then I get so I'm just looping over t and I'm adding up the n degrees. Only looping over t. M. So I'll count every edge once. Okay, so I get now I'm looping over s and i. And I'm getting m points every time. And that gives me mn squared. Sorry, I should have just done it that way from the beginning. OK, so this takes mn squared time. This is not so impressive because we could have taken our mn time algorithm from last time and run it from everybody and got the same thing. OK, so we haven't made much progress yet. Um, all right. But can we do better within this framework? This is this is a nice trick. So suppose 
All right, so this is this is our algorithm written nicely. Now, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so we're going to do all choices of S and T and I. So that'll get you everyone. Yeah. This loop. Yeah, the number of vertices going into T in degree. So if I look at all the all the vertices in the graph, right? And I say, okay, how what's the in degree of this? Well, there's one. What's the in degree of this? Oh, there's four. What's the in degree of this? Oh, there's two. And I added them all up, right? I circle all the vertices count in degree. Every edge is only going to get counted once, exactly once. It's going to be be counted at the vertex is going into. So if I sum up, I'll I'll recover the total number of edges. Yeah? Well, we don't need it in the algorithm, but, but in general, uh, if you wanted to know the in degree of everybody, you can first take your graph and just count up all the edges. So you'll spend linear time total building out this, this table. Yeah. Um, here, our algorithm does not actually use the in degree. It's just that when we add things up, the time is proportional to the in degree. OK. So, Okay, let me ask uh, this. All right, so let me look at a special case of the parameter i. Suppose, well, let me leave that here. Suppose I told you that i happened to be a power of two. Okay, so it was of the form, maybe I'll write k. Two to the k for some integer k. Okay, so you're asking, oh, what's the best way to get there in two edges, four edges, eight edges, 16, 32, that kind of thing. Um, could we do something clever here? I'm specifically looking at a power of two, 128. Yeah. Yeah, so good. So that's the right intuition. So what can I do algorithmically to make things faster? If, if I'm really just worried about powers of two. So powers of two are sufficient because I can take any number I want and round it up to the power of two if I wanted. Yes. Uh, yes, so that here that will correspond to two to the k minus one. Okay. So I can try to do something like walks of length two to the K minus one and two to the K minus one, right? So if it's 128, I wanna know what's the best way to get 128. Oh, let's find a midpoint, go 64, you go 64, or at most 64, right? Okay, that's good. Uh, there's still a little bit of an issue with our code. Yeah, so th this loop over u, right? We're actually just guessing the midpoint. We're no longer looping over the edges, leaving s or entering t or something like this. So, um, right, so here then would be a, a different algorithm. Same idea, but it's going to be faster. So here are some base cases. They're a little bit different because i equals zero for the power two to the i actually corresponds to using one edge, right? Okay, so so here we either I'm at 128, either 64 edges was plenty, or I guess I try all midpoints u and say okay this plus this. 
Okay, distance from S to U using 64 edges at most 64, distance from U to T using at most 64 edges. All right, now what is the running time of this algorithm and why? So I'm only, yeah, how many subproblems will I have? Yeah, so there's going to be n choices of s, n choices of t, and then I only need to do i from 1 to log n because 2 to the log n will give me n. Okay, log rounded up. Okay, so there's only n squared log n subproblems. And how long does a, a subproblem take? And so now I'm looping over all the vertices. So you end up with n cubed log n. Okay. But this is this is just a you know compared to what we did last time, we just inserted t. That wasn't too special. And then we add this nice what's called a doubling trick. There's lots of uh, other situations where sometimes a doubling trick can come in handy. Okay. All right, so the next part is a different recursive algorithm, which actually you all hit on in our earlier discussion. Okay, so I think this will be implicitly very similar. So let's order the vertices uh, arbitrarily. I'm not concerned about which particular order. So last time, in the last two classes, we've always been doing induction on number of edges, number of edges, number of edges. Now I'm going to try to do induction on this ordering. Okay, so we're going to write a recursive spec like this. So I have three parameters, i, j, and k, which refers to, oh, first vertex, 10th vertex, 20th vertex, or something. Okay, and our sentence is going to be, okay, I want to get from vertex i to vertex j but I can only use the vertices between 1 and k. So I want to get from vertex 100 to vertex 50, but I can only use vertices 1 through 25 in the middle. Okay. And then we could try to kind of grow this out over time. By the end, you should be allowed to use any vertex. All right, so that's, that's the idea. Suppose we wanted to implement this. How should we implement? Or what are the base cases? K is equal to what? K is equal to one? I'm gonna go with K equals zero. That means you can't use any vertices in between. Then it's gonna be like uh, zero, if i is equal to j, uh, the length of the edge from i to j, if vi, vj is an edge, and otherwise it'll be like positive infinity. That's the only way to get from i to j if there's no intermediate vertices. The so more interesting case is when k is bigger than zero. And you've already figured out, in particular, k minus 1. So you know how to use vertices 1 through 99. Now you're allowed to use vertex number 100. So something like uh, this, S, W, I, J, K minus 1, where I'm not using that vertex. And he said the minimum over some vertex U, right? Okay, okay, help me out. So, okay. Uh, or the minimum of, what should I write? What should I write? Uh, 
Oh, okay. So if you're allowed to, if, if using the kth vertex helps, uh, yeah, plus. There is no min here, actually. Just, you could use the kth or not. If you are allowed going to use the kth, the 100th vertex, and you're only allowed to use vertices 1 through 100, then you want to get to the 100th vertex with the best path using 1 through 99. And then you want to go from the 100th vertex to your destination with the best path using vertices 1 through 99. So that's the idea. No big deal. Uh, what's the running time? Uh, I heard n cubed. Why n cubed? How many subproblems are there? n cubed. So there's uh, n choices of i, n choices of j, n choices of k. And then how long does the subproblem take? Yeah, because I'm just really adding up two two numbers. So assuming you save everything in a you know with some caching, use dynamic programming, then it's number of subproblems times time per subproblem, and you get n cubed. That's actually a little better than the n cubed log n we just did. Okay. Um, okay. So that's what we have for this all pair shortest pass. Any questions about this? Otherwise, I'm going to introduce Wednesday's topic. So, so the vertices are are uh, ordered arbitrarily at the beginning. So they're just numbered one through a million. And uh, and k is sort of coming from the problem. You know. You're trying to get from one vertex to another using the first 100 vertices. And you're saying, well, I either don't have to use the 100th vertex, or if I am going to use the 100th vertex, then let me get to the 100th from my source as efficiently as possible using the first 99. Let me get from the 100th vertex to the destination as efficiently as possible using the first 99 vertex vertices. Yeah, this is again with no loops. This is again in no negative cycles. Yeah, a little bit different than what we did last time. It does, it does, it does do okay with negative edges. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can we do something more refined? Can I look at uh, which vertices, you know, if the 100th vertex has no neighbors among the first 99, there's nothing to do and stuff like this. And maybe you would have it, well, your code would just have an empty loop. Um, but it, it, won't, it won't help you in the worst case in the running time. So in the worst case, I mean, yeah, you can just have tons of edge. You know, first of all, our running time, which was, I, didn't, I never wrote it out, order n cubed, is independent of the number of edges, right? And so, like, I don't know, you could have like uh, tons of edges with like you know teeny tiny weight, you still get the same. Yeah. So, you could try baking in these heuristics in your code or something, but but it won't get you a better worst case running time. All right. So let me try to motivate Wednesday's lecture in the remaining time. So typically...